Hello, I apologize for the technical issues that we've had. My name is Jason Dominitz, and I'm the National Program Director for Gastroenterology in the Department of Veterans Affairs and Professor of Medicine at the University of Washington School of Medicine in the Division of Gastroenterology. I want to thank everyone for joining this webinar. We've had a lot of interest in this topic and appreciate that you've made time in your schedule to participate. Fecal immunochemical testing, or FIT, is the most commonly used method for colorectal cancer screening worldwide. However, its effectiveness is frequently undermined by failure to obtain follow-up colonoscopy after positive test results, and we know how important that colonoscopy is. The purpose of today's webinar is to review evidence and processes to help ensure that patients obtain a follow-up colonoscopy after a positive FIT result, and to give you some practical advice for making sure patients get the life-saving follow-up they need. This webinar will not address access issues for securing that follow-up colonoscopy, but in a moment, I will share a few roundtable resources that address this and provide additional relevant background on the topic. During the webinar, we'll hear from Dr. Kevin Selby, a general internist and postdoctoral researcher at Kaiser Permanente's Division of Research. We'll also hear from Amanda Petrick, research associate at Kaiser Permanente Center for Health Research, and from Dr. Frank Colangelo, an internist and chief quality officer at Premier Medical Associates in the greater Pittsburgh area. I'd like to share a few housekeeping items before we get started. First, we are recording today's webinar. The replay and speaker slides will be shared with all of you in a few days. Please feel free to share this with your colleagues that couldn't join us today. Also, because of the large number of participants, you are currently muted on the webinar. Having said that, we will want to make sure that you get what you need out of the webinar, so we encourage you to ask questions by submitting them through the, question, the webinar's Q&A function. We will have time for questions after the presentations, and we will answer as many of them as we can. We'll also be emailing around responses to any questions we don't have time to get to. You can also email us specific questions afterward. And finally, we're always trying to improve our webinars, so we are asking for your help in evaluating this webinar. You will be receiving an email with a survey link. Please help us out with this by taking a few minutes to provide feedback. We take this advice very seriously, and we're always trying to improve. So with that, I'd like to share a few additional resources. For advice on securing access to colonoscopy, I encourage you to check out the latest webinar on the Links of Care pilot projects. These projects seek to improve colorectal cancer screening and follow-up care for uninsured and underinsured patients by strengthening relationships between community health centers and the surrounding medical neighborhood. For more general guidance on stool-based tests, the Roundtable's newly revised Clinician's Reference Tool provides state-of-the-science information about stool-based tests including characteristics of high-quality stool-based screening programs. And finally, the Roundtable's June 2016 webinar on implementing fit screening programs provides additional practical advice. Now, it's my great pleasure to turn over this webinar to Dr. Selby, who will share a review of the evidence on this topic and a bit about what Kaiser Permanente of Northern California is doing to address this issue. Welcome, Dr. Selby. Thank you, Jason. So, I will what I'll be speaking about today is a systematic review that we did and then also a little bit of our experience at Kaiser Permanente Northern California. So no conflicts of interest to disclose. As Jason mentioned, low rates of follow-up colonoscopy after positive fecal blood tests are a problem. As I don't think I need to convince anybody here, fecal immunochemical tests are ideal for mass screening. They're, they could be performed at home they're easy to do and have high sensitivity for colorectal cancer. However, real-world efficacy depends on colonoscopy follow-up. In the landmark randomized trials that showed that GWIAC FOBT worked, follow-up rates were in the upper 80 to 90 percent. However, in several real-world settings, follow-up is as low as 50 percent after six months. And people are often surprised when they implement a GWIAC-based or fecal immunochemical-based screening program and then realize that people aren't getting the follow-up colonoscopies. It's challenging because follow-up involves interaction of multiple levels of care. Patients need to get a referral, need to make it to the, to the gastroenterologist, and multiple pieces need to work together. Another element that we've been finding is that patients are sometimes reluctant to get the colonoscopy after a test. When women have positive mammographies in our system, we talk about sort of the number of sleepless nights that women have between the positive mammography to making it to a biopsy because people are very anxious and want to get that biopsy as quickly as possible, nearly universally, 
Whereas with positive fit, people often need a little bit of convincing. They sometimes think it's something they ate or a positive hemorrhoid, and messages need to be clear of the importance of colonoscopy. Colonoscopy delays after a fecal test are important as well because they can have a very important impact on patient outcomes. This is an analysis of 70,000 fit positive patients from Kaiser Permanente that showed an increased risk of cancer, and specifically advanced stage cancer, when time to colonoscopy is greater than six months. So as you can see on the right, there are adjusted odds ratios. And once you get into the seven to 12 month time period after a positive test, your odds of any colorectal cancer and advanced stage colorectal cancer begins to increase. So we published a systematic review last year looking at interventions to improve follow-up of positive results on fecal blood tests. Our objective was to evaluate interventions to improve the follow-up, as I mentioned, of either FIT or GWIAC-based FOBT. We included both randomized and non-randomized studies, and we focused on interventions to improve colonoscopy follow-up of positive tests. And our primary outcome was looking at follow-up within six months. Our overall results were that we found 23 studies that were eligible. There were seven randomized and 16 non-randomized studies. Only three of the studies were randomized and at low risk of bias. So the results that I'm presenting today do need to be taken with a certain grain of salt because some of these findings may change in subsequent trials. And we did not do any meta-analysis given the significant heterogeneity between trials. And by heterogeneity, I mean in terms of the outcomes that were reported and in terms of the specific interventions. However, I do think that it's valuable to go through these studies in some detail to get a, a flavor for what interventions have been working elsewhere. So our first category are patient-level interventions. These are interventions that specifically target the patients who had the positive test. The first category might seem a little bit non-intuitive. These are changes to invitation strategy to screening. Here there were two studies, including one randomized study. The reason why we included this is that there's been some concern that interventions to increase screening rates could lead to decreases in follow-up. However, in these two studies that we included and some other observational findings, interventions to increase screening using fecal tests don't worsen follow-up to positive tests. So that is encouraging. Next is provision to patients of test results or follow-up appointments. Here there were four studies, including one randomized trial. These studies mailed or called patients to provide results or directly provided appointments to discuss follow-up colonoscopy. In some organized screening programs, results are only sent to the ordering physician or the ordering provider. And the changes that were made here were to have those results go directly to the patient, oftentimes with a phone call. The randomized trial that was included here was that among initial non-responders in Italy, a specialized nurse increased follow-up by 12%. And all of the percents that I'm showing here are percent increase in the number of people who complete colonoscopy. Next is patient navigation. Here there were five studies, including two randomized trials at low risk of bias. In the first randomized trial, a registered nurse patient navigator increased follow-up from 80.8% .8 to 91% at six months. As you can see, the confidence interval here crosses zero, so the trial was not statistically significant. However, it was underpowered because of a higher rate of follow-up than expected in their control arm. And this was a very well done randomized trial in the Northwest of the US by Green et al. I would encourage all of you to look at who are interested in this. Second randomized trial was used patient navigators for multiple cancers including colorectal cancer positive tests, and use what a uh, strength-based approach. And here they increased follow-up rates from 58% to 79% at one year, a 21% increase. 
Our next overall category are provider level interventions. Here there is only one type of intervention. This was provision to providers of reminders and or performance data. There were different combinations. Here there were five studies, including two cluster randomized trials. All of the studies used electronic algorithms to identify or the ordering provider of the test or an assigned primary care physician. These were systems where the positive tests would sometimes be, get lost and they used electronic algorithms to clearly identify who was responsible and then remind the person responsible if there was inadequate action after 60 or 90 days. By inadequate action, there was no referral, or if there was a referral, there hadn't been a colonoscopy booked, or at the later time point, if the colonoscopy hadn't been completed. Four of these were from integrated systems in the U.S. and generally were multi-component interventions. So that means that not only were these reminders sent, but also physicians got performance data and some education about this issue. One was from a provincial screening program and showed no difference. The third overall category of system level interventions. Here there were a number of different types of interventions. One was automated referral to gastroenterologist. These were both from Veterans Affairs Medical Centers and this involved positive tests going directly to gastroenterologists with electronic patient information as opposed to being sent to the primary care physician or the ordering provider. Next was the replacement of pre-colonoscopy visit with a telephone call. This was in a European program, and instead of patients being obliged to have a face-to-face -face consultation, they had the choice of a phone call instead. Next was the creation of a registry to track patients with positive results. This was an older study that showed that just having a registry regularly reviewed by a nurse manager led to a 23% improvement over several years. Though it is important to note that many of these other studies also included the creation of a registry just to be able to figure out which patients had to be targeted. Finally, there were multi-component quality improvement efforts. There were three studies, all from the Veterans Affairs again, that were observational using pre-post design and showed low levels of improvement of 6 to 10 percent in the number of people getting colonoscopy. So looking over these studies, we felt that there was moderate evidence sorry, to support patient navigators, and especially because the evidence in this category, which is the follow-up of positive tests, really follow, follows with strong evidence of having patients get to a screening colonoscopy and in the follow-up of symptomatic patient. One of the randomized trials included here calculated that it costs an additional 275 US dollars per patient. So obviously some cost involved. However, patients with positive fit have already been triaged as high risk patients. So this cost could still be worth it in some ways. Um, there was also moderate evidence to support provider reminders and or performance feedback. These were done in integrated systems with electronic health record tracking. This tracking allowed the automatic identification of patients with positive tests who did not appear to have follow-up. And subsequently, the list of the patients with positive tests would be reviewed to figure out whether or not that was a true result or not. Another low-cost intervention we felt was worth highlighting was the directly notifying endoscopists of all positive fecal test results. There was only low-level evidence for all the other intervention types. Finally, I just quickly wanted to, to show some of what we were doing at Kaiser Permanente Northern California. You will have the slides afterwards, so if I go quickly, it's all right. But um, the median time to colonoscopy in the FIT-based screening program is 36 days, and 83% have had a colonoscopy by six months. The way that this is being done is that the traditional flow where the positive FIT goes to the primary care doctor and the patient is given a result and, and is responsible for getting to gastroenterology on their own is being changed over time. And what is happening is that more gastroenterology offices are directly getting fit positive results. And if there hasn't been an e-consult placed by the primary care provider, the, the gastroenterology offices actually place the consult themselves. And then they have schedulers who provide the patient with the result, schedule the appointment, 
and then have a navigator call to explain colonoscopy, logistics, risks, and preparation with the patient. There are a minimum of three attempts to contact all patients. If a patient has not been contacted by the schedulers, then a registered letter is sent to the patient and electronic contact is attempted as well, and the primary care physician is notified. On top of all this, there are several organizational supports. Uh, there had to be an increase in colonoscopy capacity to have a bit more flexibility for appointment times. There's a registry, as in the other places. There's a gastroenterology staff member who has overall responsibility for the program in each department. And then there's frequent feedback of fit positive follow-up performance. So some of the take-home point, um, more work and research are needed. Many of the areas of the interventions, there's only low-level evidence. Patient navigators appear to work, but can be expensive. Provider reminder systems and direct referrals are promising lower-cost interventions for those with integrated electronic health records. At Kaiser Northern California, gastroenterology departments are increasingly taking primary responsibility. And the higher performing service areas are proactive in their patient outreach, often calling patients, and have a clearly designated team member responsible for fit positive follow-up. Thank you very much. Great, thanks, Kevin. Um, this is Amanda Patrick. I am uh, enjoying a beautiful morning in the Pacific Northwest, so good morning to some of you, or afternoon. Um, I'm presenting on behalf of Gloria Coronado, and Gloria and I have worked on projects over the past six years to increase screening and safety net clinics or federally qualified health care centers, mostly in Washington, Oregon, and California. And most of our work on the projects that I'll be talking about today have been funded through the National Cancer Institute. Okay. So we've been working in safety net clinics to increase colorectal cancer screening by implementing male fecal testing programs. And our main project on which we did this is the Stop CRC project. And I'll be referencing this project throughout this presentation. Stop CRC worked with 30 clinics in Oregon, Washington, and California to create a series of electronic health record tools to mail fit test to patients. And that is about nine health systems. And while 8.7 million patients complete fecal testing each year in the U.S., the problem is that not all individuals who have the abnormal test complete the follow-up colonoscopy. So for these patients, the benefit of fecal testing is actually nullified. The diagram on the right here shows that the screening path following an abnormal fecal test is not complete until the colonoscopy is completed. We created a document with this diagram for our prompt project with the Ultimate Community Health Centers in Los Angeles through a process called Boot Camp Translation, which is where their patients gave us feedback on our materials, and we really wanted a visual of the whole process from start to finish. So for our work on Stop CRC and work from David List, we found that only about 52 to 54 percent of patients in the safety net clinic setting who have an abnormal fecal test are actually completing their follow-up colonoscopy. We know this is a problem because we know these patients are already showing blood in the stool and the likelihood of detecting polyps, adenomas, or cancers is high. So to, through this presentation, I hope to explain what we've learned mainly through the process of chart reviews and qualitative interviews uh, about the patient's experience with follow-up colonoscopy, about the provider's experience with performing colonoscopy, and also some novel ways to select patients if you choose to do patient navigation or one of the other alternatives that Kevin just described. So through Step Tier C, we did an initial chart abstraction of patients with an abnormal fit test, and we found the majority of the patients had no reason indicated in the chart for why they were either not referred or referred but didn't show a completed colonoscopy. You can see here that about 30% of the patients declined colonoscopy for before the referral, and 28% declined after the referral. And some patients were unable to reach, and some reported prior colonoscopy so that a follow-up may not have actually been needed. But the first two lines, the no reason indicated and the patient decline lines, 
are the patients for whom an intervention like patient navigation might be the most effective. We were able to conduct qualitative interviews among patients and providers, and we found that in some cases, providers and patients both identified similar barriers, especially in coordinating the patient's logistical issues like arranging a ride or taking time off of work. And both patients and providers identified barriers to the cost of colonoscopy and confusion about the whole colonoscopy process. But providers and patients each identified their own barriers. Providers identified issues with valve prep, billing issues, and dealing with patients' fears. And patients reported delays in getting an appointment, concerns with having multiple health issues at the same time, such as diabetes. These results show a completion of colonoscopy with one year. And just to note, not shown on this slide, we found only about 57% of our patients obtained a colonoscopy within 18 months, and only 25% obtained a colonoscopy within 60 days, which is the preferred interval for um, a follow-up colonoscopy after an abnormal fecal test. But you can see here that more younger patients obtained their colonoscopy within a year, and it's about 59 versus 52% in the 65 to 74 age group. And additionally, more patients with commercial insurance or Medicaid completed their colonoscopy when compared to Medicare uninsured or unknown health insurance status. So we started working with our clinics to implement patient navigation to get their patients screening completed. And ideally, Patient navigation would follow Lynn Butterly's model that addresses six topics to ensure that screening take place, takes place. Her topics include items such as what is CRC, the education, identifying barriers, addressing the bowel prep process, and also just communicating with the patient what to expect on the day of the test. We know that patient navigation is widely endorsed, but we know not everyone needs the navigation and we need to be able to ascertain who is likely or unlikely to complete their colonoscopy follow-up. So to winnow the targets for patient navigation, you could simply select patients who screen positive on a fit, who have never had a colonoscopy, who don't have an appointment scheduled within a few weeks of a referral. You could ask your providers to assess the patient, see if they're resistant or, or could benefit from referral to navigation. Or you can create a risk prediction model, which I'll describe in the next few slides. We knew that there was a fundamental problem of trying to get people to follow up, and we wanted to identify those that have the low to moderate probability of completing a follow-up colonoscopy, and that's that three dots on the bottom right. And identifying who needed patient navigation because it's expensive and time-consuming, as Kevin described from his reviews. So we created a risk prediction model in our FQHC population. We identified patients with an abnormal test result. We determined which factors would determine their likelihood of completing a follow-up colonoscopy. And our model in the stop CRC patients showed that age, race, insurance, living in a community with income inequality, anticoagulant use, prior no-show appointments, we see the flu shots, and their health center can predict if a patient was more or less likely to complete a colonoscopy. So the bottom lines in this graph, the B and C lines, were the patients with the lowest probability of following up. And these would be the patients that we would want to navigate. We don't want to waste the resources in navigating patients who we know would get their colonoscopy on their own. We're testing a similar model in the Kaiser Permanente population now in the Northwest, and we're planning on testing a similar FQH FQHC model in Washington this year. So in conclusion, we know that low rates of follow-up colonoscopy need to be recognized and interventions tested to close the screening gap. System and patient level barriers contribute and need to be addressed. And that using precision medicine through patient navigation can save costs and hopefully improve outcomes. And as usual, we have to acknowledge our large team to contribute to this work. I'm going to pass the ball to Frank.
Thanks, Amanda. So Frank Colangio will go next. Hi, good afternoon and good morning, everyone who's listening in. So I'm going to bring a little different spin to this since I'm coming from the East Coast instead of everyone that's on the West Coast of the United States. It's a lovely gray snowy morning here in Pittsburgh today. So, so I'm Frank Colangelo. I'm an internist who still practices in a busy practice and the chief quality officer for our practice. No conflicts of interest. Um, outline of the talk. I don't have to spend much time on that because we'll go through things. Just wanted to give a little word. Everyone knows who Kaiser Permanente is. I just want to give a little spiel about P Premier Medical Associates. So we have our lovely Chamber of Commerce picture of the city of Pittsburgh and Premier Medical Associates is about 100 providers in 22 specialties. We're part of Highmark Health and the Allegheny Health Network. Located in about a 15 mile radius in the eastern suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And a busy practice, 377,000 visits in 2016, high performing everyone's patient center medical home. AMGA, the American Medical Group Association, has a group of 40 practices from across the country called Analytics for Improvement, in which everyone shares best practice data, how we can improve patient outcomes, and we're very proud about our work that we've done with practices from across the nation. And when we're talking about our efforts for screening patients with colon cancer, we have an active population of 18,700 patients between the age of 50 and 75. And about one-sixth of them choose to be screened every year with FIT, so uh, it's a fair number of them that go that route. So. And we have up all scripts. We have a point of care registry that's in real time that points out to providers whether patients are uh, up to date with colon cancer screening or not, so that's helped our process. Now, in the summer of 2012, I was at a CME meeting and heard Dr. Wender, Richard Wender, talk about the, you know, need to increase colon cancer screening rates across the nation. And at first, it was the Screen for Life program that the CDC was forming that led to the development of 80 by 2018. And I can remember a couple take-home messages that he had at that meeting. It was you need to measure your practice as colon cancer screening rate. It may not be as good as you think that it is. And your providers need to offer more than just colonoscopies to patients. You can get good screening rates. If you offer only colonoscopies, you're not going to get great screening rates unless you offer a patient an alternative method for screening. So went back to the practice and we realized we had a lot of work to do. We only had a 57.5% screening rate at that time five years ago. Many of our providers were only offering colonoscopies to patients. Dr. Wender came to our, our practice and had a two-hour Grand Rods type presentation in which he, you know, really emphasized the importance of fit testing for increasing screening rates. And this was our first thing that we did in our practice. It was our first large-scale population health effort, and this is where we learned the power of transparent reporting for increasing provider performance. So, you know, we had an effort where we, the, those are made up names, but actual data where we gave these to providers, you know, how they were performing, they really didn't care. We then added bar graphs and then we added the 80% goal line and the patients who fell below the, eight, or the providers whose panel screening rates fell below 80% initially had an uprising. They were concerned that it was hurting their self-esteem. The practice persisted. We said, listen, continue increasing your patient's colon cancer screening rate, then you won't be on the right side of that screen any longer. So we've used this for many other quality improvement processes since that time. And we finally did it. We had a, I, it was interesting, over a period of I, 15 months, we raised our screening rate from 57.5% to 75%. And then we hit a plateau. It took us another two and a half years to get to 80%. So and we looked at it, we got rid of a lot of the low hanging fruit, the patients who were willing to be screened, and then started bumping up against the patients who were more reluctant about doing so. But we got to the 80% mark across our practice in October of 16 and have stayed there since that time. We were honored by the National Colorectal Roundtable as part of our efforts for improving colon cancer screening rates. So that was very uh, gratifying for our practice. Now, we had too had a problem with positive fit follow-up. And I wanna, after about a year of doing our program, I asked our lab information system to send me a list of every patient who had had a positive fit test in the previous year. And there were 205 positives, went back and reviewed all of them and realized that only 57.5% of those patients had completed a colonoscopy. And that's my, my bitmoji of my reaction whenever I saw that. I was sick whenever I saw that. Made a frantic telephone call to Dr. Wender late on a Friday afternoon explaining the problem. 
And he said, you can relax. You're actually doing pretty good compared to a lot of the country at 57.5%. But, you know, I took some reassurance in that, but we weren't happy or satisfied with that and knew that we wanted to improve that over time. So what did we do? How did we increase our follow-up rate for patients getting colonoscopies after those positive fit tests? We realized there were some providers, as Kevin said earlier, the patient would say, oh, it's a hemorrhoid, it was something I ate. The, the patient would convince the, patient, the doctor to order another fit test. We educated all our providers, the only appropriate response to a positive screening test is to have a follow-up diagnostic colonoscopy performed. We gave a new script to providers so they could say to patients, I will agree to allow you to be screened with a fit only if you will promise me that you will have a follow-up colonoscopy if that fit result is positive. We educated to our staff. In the past, the patient would say, no, I'm not getting a colonoscopy, and they would simply close the order, say patient refused. That would be the end of the discussion. We educated the staff about the importance of the follow-up diagnostic colonoscopy, gave them scripted responses for reluctant patients, and made sure that they had a feedback loop that they would report back to the primary care provider that the patient was hesitant or declining to get the test performed. So that seemed to help efforts. We created a positive fit registry within the practice. Every Monday I get a report from the lab of patients who tested positive in the last week so that we can track these patients and see what they do with their follow-up colonoscopy order over time. There's an alert in our EHR banner if a person has had a positive fit and hasn't completed a colonoscopy that sits in front of the provider so that they can remind the patient at every single encounter that they should go ahead and um, have the testing performed. We have a positive fit registry that we have maintained for over five years now that has all the details of the person with the positive fit, what the date did they complete their testing, what's their mailing address. This is kind of small, I'm sorry, on your computer screen, but on the first of each month, we review patients who had had a positive fit test over the last four to six weeks, but had not yet scheduled a follow or completed a follow-up colonoscopy and mail them a letter personalized to the patient signed by their provider saying you had this positive test, you are at an increased risk of possibly having a, an advanced adenomatous polyp or an early colon cancer. We want you to have the testing performed. And about every six months, we have been recalculating what our follow-up colonoscopy rate is. And I feel bad that I never kept data points over time as to how our improvement did. But when I last calculated about two months ago, from between March 30th of 2012 and November 11th of 2017, we had had an 87 and a half completion rate of patients with positive fits who went on to complete their colonoscopy. And that included those first 118 patients who refused to have a colonoscopy done. Some of those we were able to convince over time that they had to have the testing done. So we were very proud that we've been able to drive this kind of performance and have kept it going, uh, going forward. And, um, Kevin pointed out in his slides about the, the Kaiser study from Dr. Corley about the need for timely follow-up of the colonoscopy after a positive fit test. We had never had the chance to do this before, but I was able to analyze the data and look back and see that about 80% of our patients have their follow-up colonoscopy done within three months, and only 5% have it wait 10 months or more, which was the time period in the Dr. Corley study that there was a large increase in the number of patients with uh, advanced cancers. So I was happy that our experience sort of mirrors the Kaiser uh, experience over time. And that's, a, I, that's a, a quick whirlwind tour through how we have driven our results for, forward. And I think that we are going to continue having high re success with having patients complete their colonoscopy after they have a fit test completed. Well, thank you, Frank. This is Jason Dominus again. I want to thank Kevin Salby, Amanda Petrick, and Frank Colangelo for their excellent presentations. Um, now, we're going to take some time for questions. We have until the top of the hour, so we'll get through as many questions as possible. If you do have a question, please submit it in the chat box, and we'll take them one by one. So I'm going to start at the top and see where what we've got so far. So uh, Kristen asks, can you speak more on your experience incorporating patient navigators into this workflow to ensure that diagnostic colonoscopies are scheduled and completed after a positive fit? I know that Amanda talked about um, some strategies. Uh, Amanda, do you have anything to add to what you've already presented to answer Kristen's question? 
Sure. We're just now working with our Kaiser uh, GI department, QI and GI department, actually, to integrate the patient navigators into the workflow. And we are providing them with a list of the patients most at risk. So they're going to start from the bottom up and working with patients with the least likely probability of obtaining a colonoscopy and then working towards the highest. Um, and then I noticed that there was a follow-up question down below about the different risks. So I can kind of incorporate that into this answer as well. Um, the, the way that we modeled, the way that the model was created was with deciles. And so each of the different lines represents a fifth of the population. So for the FQHC population, we're probably going to have to work with the first two or three lines that have the least probability because their probability of getting a colonoscopy was less than 50%. The KP population, Kaiser, because their GI services are integrated, they do a little bit better because it's direct referrals. And so they'll only have to focus on the bottom line of the probability. So I hope that answers that question as well. Frank, you guys uh, haven't been formally using patient navigators, but uh, you have a, a number of strategies. Do you, or do you want to comment on uh, any navigation going on at your facility? No, I mean that, you know, we, we call our, our nurses that some practices call care coordinators, we call them nurse navigators because they help to guide high risk patients through things. But we've been able to drive these results simply with using our, our the typical medical assistant staff and, and the provider scripting that, that we give to patients. So that we thankfully haven't had to add that expense to our care team. So. Thanks, Frank. And while I've got you speaking, there's a number of questions about whether or not you're able to share the scripts that you that you mentioned. You know, I I wish I could remember them off by heart, you know, but it is it's sort of goes back with what Kevin said at the beginning about the the anxiety to have the testing done after the mammogram. You know, with this one, the patient, you know, the the medical assistant says to the patient, you realize a positive test it means that you could possibly have a colon cancer that could cause devastating consequences if you ignore this at this time. So that's more, well, I'm still not sure about that. Isn't the, isn't it difficult to, you know, the prep is terrible. I've heard that. Well, you know, our GI department has several different preps that they can offer for patients. Perhaps they can work with you. So it's more, you know, than the old days when they would simply say, okay, you don't want to have it done and hang up the phone. They, they are encouraged to have conversations using some motivational interviewing techniques that they've been trained with to get the patients. And then I think once they have them on the hook, okay, I guess I'll do this, then they do a soft handoff by transferring to the GI department for scheduling. So. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. I mean, having some talking points for your staff, you know, that fit positive means that somebody has about a 2 to 6% chance of having colon cancer. Um, so you could, you know, you could take kind of somewhere in the middle of 4% chance of having colon cancer, it's the number's high enough to hopefully motivate them to get scoped, but not so high to scare them. Um, but having those talking points, I think, can be quite helpful. Uh, Kevin, there was a question for you about sharing your paper. I don't know if people could email you and you could send them a copy or if there's Yeah, other... definitely. If people want to email me directly, I can, uh, I can share that. Um, one, one more thing, just to add this to Patient Navigator, um, not all of our, our gastroenterology offices have a you know a specific nurse who works just on this issue. Obviously, um, fit positives aren't as there aren't as many as some other health issues. So oftentimes uh, we have scripts that are used by by schedulers. So these aren't nurses, but people who are doing a lot of phone calls or medical assistants, and that works well. And then if people have more complicated medical cases or specific medical problems then the, their cases can be referred to a nurse to follow up by phone and things like that. But um, we find that the important thing is to deliver this message of sort of the importance and then have someone who can directly book the patient at, on the phone at that time on the same call. Thanks, Kevin. Amanda, there's a question about whether or not you can share the graphics for the, uh, the 1 in 10 needing colonoscopy. I don't know. If you want to comment on that? Yeah, you bet. There, we do have all of our materials on our website, and I can type it into the chat box in just a second. But it's research. It's kpchr.org 
forward slash mailed fit. And all of our materials for both the Stop CRC project and the prompt project and another project that I didn't reference today called Benefit, where there's workflows for working with a health plan, um, all of those materials are you are more than welcome to take them and adapt them. If you need a Word document from a PDF, feel free to email me. My email is on that website as well. Thanks, Amanda. Um, let's see, I'm going to go through some other questions, but I will comment that, you know, the nccrt.org website has a lot of great information as well. Some of those talking points that I spoke to earlier, I think you'll find those there. Uh, people are asking if they can get a copy of the PowerPoint. Yes, all, uh, as I said earlier, um, we will be sending out a copy of the, um, of the PowerPoint and link to the recording of the webinar, and you can share that with your colleagues. Um, let's see, so there's a question. Were there any effective initiatives that targeted populations of color or monolingual populations? Uh, Amanda, can you address that topic? Yeah, you bet. The, our prompt project, the project that we're, we just got done with the pilot, it's in LA. We're working with Altamed. Altamed's system is, it varies between 70 and 80 percent Hispanic. Our boot camp translation uh, efforts focused mainly on Spanish speaking separate from the English-speaking population to make sure that we were communicating the whole process of fecal testing followed up by colonoscopy to the patients. Um, and then, of course, our FQHC population is diverse. It depends on the clinic uh, because we've worked in so many that we've tried to adapt our materials. Some of our wordless instructions for the fecal test um, from different clinics have been created to um, help with language issues <clears throat> and uh, the Multnomah County uh, Insure Fit Test instructions actually used cartoons so that they could speak to a low literacy population. Thanks, Amanda. Kevin or uh, Frank, anything to add? Um. No, just I think I mentioned when we were at the meeting in December. I mean, I, you know, I had the map of our offices in Pittsburgh. I mean, it, you know, the 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 office that was furthest to the east on the map is closest to the city. It has about 20, 25 patients with Medicaid insurance. So it's a, I'm going to say a lower socioeconomic group than there are some of the ones more suburban. But we have an 80% screening rate at every single one of our offices. So. Whatever we've done has translated across the the socioeconomic groups that are represented at our at our at our seven large primary care offices across the practice. Um, Thanks, Frank. Um, I see a question from Catherine Bauer. Um, I think Catherine's asking if patients who have had a fit need to pay for their colonoscopies. Catherine, maybe you can type in to clarify because I got this wrong. Um, so. Uh, under the, my understanding is under the Affordable Care Act, the screening test is fully covered. So if somebody has a screening colonoscopy, that is fully covered by insurance. If they have a screening by FIT, that's fully covered. However, any diagnostic test that follows it uh, is subject to co-pays. Now, that, that is a very unfortunate aspect to the way the law is written right now, and there's some, I know there's some efforts to try to change that, but right now that's the way it stands. So. If somebody has a fit that's positive, the colonoscopy is considered a diagnostic test and is not covered under the prevention benefits of the screening you know, insurance program. Along the same lines, unfortunately, if you have a screening colonoscopy that finds a polyp, which happens about 40% of the time, that polypectomy uh, now has converted that from a screening colonoscopy to a diagnostic slash therapeutic colonoscopy, and so people can get co-pays even on that quote-unquote screening colonoscopy. So this is an area of uh, concern for, for many people. Um, it's, it's a big problem that uh, needs some legislative relief. Uh, hopefully I got Catherine's question right. If not, please uh, write back. Uh, it's, I don't know if Frank, Kevin, or Amanda have any comments to add to that. Yes, it, it is true that oftentimes that is the default and that um, you know, within Kaiser, it's a little bit easier to change, but that was something that was, hadn't sort of been noticed when we first started our FIT program, was that people were getting these copays on the follow-up colonoscopy. And so it's something to be attentive to, and if you have any way within your system to change it, to try to change that to a non-copay colonoscopy. 
Thanks, Kevin. And, um, you know, at the beginning of the slides, when I did the introduction, there was uh, information about access to colonoscopy uh, through the NCCRT, more information about that whole issue of access, which and this webinar is not focused on. Um, let's see. Oh, Jason, I was just going to add one more thing. In Oregon, we were able to pass legislation that considered a follow-up colonoscopy to an abnormal fit test screening until the time the colonoscopy was done. That doesn't hold true for the Medicare patients because the Medicare law overrides, but at least for anybody with commercial health insurance or Medicaid, the, that is true in Oregon. So call your legislators and see if you can adopt policy like Oregon has. That's great. Thanks, Amanda. Uh, let's see. So there's a number of questions about access to colonoscopy. Um, again, we're, we're not going to focus on that, but I may come back to them. Let me look through the rest of the questions. Uh, somebody's asking about smart patient navigation model. Are you able to run reports from your HR of patients who fit the risk factors you identified and are most needing navigation to colonoscopy? Uh, I don't know if Frank or Amanda wants to speak to that. Yeah, I think that was about Amanda's risk prediction model. So. Sorry, I missed the question. Can you repeat it one more time, Jason? Well, they say, are, are you able to run reports in the EHR and patients who fit the risk factors you identified and are most needing navigation? So you built a model to, uh, to identify who's highest risk for not having follow-up colonoscopy and who's lowest risk. Have you implemented that, I think is the question. Using we EHR. have not. We, we hope to. Um, the components of the model are within the EHR. We've converted the model to a points-based system that will easily be put into the EHR, but that's a project in the future. So stay tuned. Okay, let's see. Frank, there's a question to you about whether or not your patients have insurance. Do most of your patients have insurance? What do you do if you have an uninsured patient with a positive fit? I, I, I had read that conversation. Yeah, mo most of our patients have insurance. I, you know, I personally, I haven't had a single person myself who didn't have insurance who had a positive fit. I, it's and I haven't, I don't know if I've run across that in terms of our registry of patients either. I'm sorry that I can't answer that question. Yeah, I, again, most of these questions are about access to care. And, I, you know, I, I'll do the best I can to try to answer these questions, as I know our other speakers will, but we may not be uh, able to answer all of these questions. Um, Catherine writes in that she thought that finding a pulp didn't change the coding in the most recent Medicare insurance. I, I don't know the answer to that. I could be wrong. I work in a VA hospital setting. And one of the nice things about working in the VA is that all of our patients are covered by VA insurance, if you want to call it that. Um, that being said, even with the ability to provide the colonoscopy at little or no cost, some patients have a $50 copay for colonoscopy. Some patients may have a $9 copay for the prescription bowel prep. So maybe $59, it could potentially be a little bit more than that. We still have problems with people getting colonoscopy after a positive fit, and there's a whole host of reasons for that. Um, you know, Amanda talked about some of the identified risk factors. You know, there are, there are patients who have transportation issues, um, can't take time off from work, et cetera. So these are challenges that we're all trying to figure out the way to uh, address that. And, um, you know, I think we all want to see 100% colonoscopy rates. In Kaiser, everybody's insured by definition, and they're seeing, what What did you say, Kevin, about 80 percent? Yes, that is correct, yeah. So and clearly uh, there's, yes, there's still, still gaps, even, even beyond access, definitely still gaps. So I think um, making sure that when people are getting screened by FIT, they're, they're informed that, you know, as Frank was saying, if it's positive, they should be getting class, be educating people up front. Uh, you're not going to get the patient to, you know, swear that they will get a colonoscopy, and you know, but we just want to make sure that they are going into it with the right mindset. Um, let's see. I want to make sure I covered all the questions, and uh, I know there were some questions about about navigation, more information. I, I believe the the roundtable has um, a document online for uh, helping with setting up navigation. I don't know if someone from the uh, American Cancer Society uh, might want to speak to that, or anyone else in the sure. call. Yes, yeah, so this is Emily Bell with the NCCRT, and we have a, a couple documents available on ncCRT.org. 
if you navigate to the Resource Center. One is a replication manual from the New Hampshire colorectal cancer screening program that details um, their successful program around uh, screening navigation. And then the second is a toolkit developed by our colleagues at the um, University of Colorado in Denver um, that goes into how to pay for screening navigation and some useful tips on how to uh, fund and sustain a program. So I definitely recommend checking out those two resources. Thanks so much, Emily. We're almost at the top of the hour. I've got a couple of uh, wrap-up slides to go through. I, I do see one question about the, or one comment about the ACA thing that PrEP should be covered. And uh, yeah, I, I don't know if patients are paying for their PrEP. Hopefully, insurers are covering that. So now um, we'll advance to the next slide, please. So I do want to thank everyone. This has been a fantastic webinar. Hopefully, the 200 and 30 or so participants on the line who feel like I do that the speakers did a great job outlining an important topic. Uh, if we didn't answer your questions, uh, please, we'll try to email answers to those that, that still have not been answered, or you could send us an email and we'll try to address them. I want to send a huge thank you to all the speakers for generously giving of their time and expertise, and thank you to the CDC for helping make this possible through their funding of the webinar. Um, I do also want you to save the date for the Roundtable's live broadcast event on March 8th and visit the Colorectal Cancer Coast to Coast website for more information. We also encourage you to visit nccrt.org and connect with us on social media to find information about upcoming Roundtable webinars and other news. For more information about today's webinar, please email us at nccrt at cancer.org. Again, nccrt at cancer.org. Thank you all for joining us today. I hope you have a wonderful day.